<laughs> Just move it while you see Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Kristen Sanders, Project Urban and Community Forester with the uh, State Forestry Division. Um, I am originally from Las Vegas. I grew up here and I recently moved back about a month before the fire. So it's a uh, pleasure to be here with all of you um, to help us all uh, recover and move forward. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a few things. Um, I'm going to kind of pass, have this um, worksheet passed around. This is um, a list of local contractors. A lot of people um, that I've gone out to to talk to um, on their properties don't know really where to get started. Um, you know, it's, it's a, when you look at all your trees, you know, what do you do? How do you even talk to your contractors about what needs to be done? Um, one thing we recommend is uh, contacting us and we will come out, we will look at your land, at your forest, um, and we will help you to, de to decipher like what needs, what are the best practices that need to be done in order for you to um, you know, we'll get rid of all of the standing dead, um, to reseed, when is the best time for replanting, um, different ways that we can use, what J Jamie's going to talk about contour felling to help with erosion, um, and it also keeps, we use what's on the land to uh, create physical barriers, so we're not bringing in materials, we're using what's there, so we'll uh, talk about that. Um, so this is not an official list. This is, these are not endorsed, formally endorsed by, um, by us, but it's just a good, a good place to start. But if you're getting it chipped into smaller particles, um, it's important that it's uh, spread thinly or else it can create um, a barrier and become hydrophobic. So we want to kind of spread it out nicely. And it can also create the fuels if you have really high piles. Um, another thing uh, with chipping and mastication, we really don't like to see chips piled up against trees. Um, it's bad for the trees. Um, it disturbs their root zone um, and also creates ladder fuels. So we want to make sure that we're spreading things out nice and evenly. Yeah, so it, there's a few, we recommend, you know, a vetting um, where you're getting your seeds from. There's a, I can give you some recommendation. There's I think Curtis and Curtis out of Clovis, um, Seeds of the Southwest. Uh, but you want, want to know, there are some seed companies that say that it's native seed, but you can't really guarantee it. So you want to really kind of be pretty choosy about where you're getting your seeds from. What was the second one you said? Um, Plants of the Southwest. And I, I think Curtis and Curtis does larger quantities, and Plants of the Southwest is a little more specialized. Um, and, they, and you can call them and, and tell them um, what seeds you want. Um, they can make you a specialized seed blend, and we can help you uh, develop that if you're interested. Um, it's also important when you, if you're spreading seed that you uh, time it correctly. Some native seeds need what's called vernalization, which means they need to be uh, sown uh, right before winter and they need to be, go through a cold period. So you really want to research, um, and we can help you with that, when is the best time to put your seed down. You also don't want to put it down, you know, in the middle of July when we're not getting any rain and you're just giving the birds food. Um, so it's important to kind of really think about when is the right time um, and, and what is the right blend. So we, we are always happy, happy to help with that. And then last thing I'm going to talk about is bark beetle. Yeah. <laughs> send that around. Sorry for all the papers, but I like to, like to send you home with something that you can refer back to. Um, 
with what we are noticing um, in the last, it probably started around September of last year, we're noticing a lot of beetle kill in stand in live trees that are adjacent to burned areas. Um, and we think it's possibly, the trees are weakened from drought, they're weakened from stress. A lot of them had fire burned through them, so they're still recovering from being burned. Um, and the beetles are moving in and starting uh, to attack some of our healthy trees. And um, we're noticing larger and larger pockets. Um, so one thing uh, that you, you'll, you'll see in this pamphlet uh, is we really want to look at timing of treatment. And I'm actually going to ask Josh, uh, when you're treating in a burned area, say high severity, is it releasing the same uh, sense that attracts the beetles as it would if you were treating life for it? Uh, so I'm, I'm not an entomologist, I'll put that out there okay. as, as a disclaimer, but my understanding is, is that if you're treating trees that, that are, are still live or are recently dead, where, where effectively it, it can still take a year or two for that tree to die fully. Okay. And it's still releasing stress pheromones and, and still has those compounds. Um. So if you have healthy trees and you're doing like a forest thinning, um, we are recommend, re recommending not treating when the trees are coming out of dormancy, um, which is typically when the average temperature is around 50 degrees. That's when the beetles are most active. They're going to start coming out. And if you are cutting trees, um, you're releasing uh, like a voltaic scent um, that's going to attract beetles to your healthy trees. And so the timing is essential and it's becoming even more essential now after the fire. Um, before there was a little more leeway on timing. Um, so we're recommending uh, really to halt treatment from late spring um, through like mid fall until the nighttime oh, temperatures yeah. start dropping. Um, because once, once you start releasing those pheromones, because we've lost all of this food, um, the concentrations are, of the beetles we're seeing are much higher and much more lethal. And the trees are stressed, so they don't um, have the ability to push the beetles out like they used to. Um, so we're, when, before we would have been a little more uh, lenient, but we're, we're getting pretty serious about what timing of treating trees. We're, we used to get a ton of snow in November. Now we're getting our snow, you know, late December and more into January. So like as early into the fall as possible, still maintaining those cold night temperatures is probably the best time. And then coming out maybe February is a good time as well. Um, and as Josh said, you know, these, tr these standing dead, uh, these died here in the West Tusa spire. Um, so they probably still have some, uh, some compounds, some live compounds. Um, the trees uh, in the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon might have probably desiccated um, to the point where, you know, we might have a, a broader window where we're not releasing as much um, attractive. So in a severely burned area where there's fire killed trees, are the barn beetles still alive in those trees? Is that what you're um, they, so there's there's different kinds of bark beetles, and if you look at the pamphlet, so there's bark beetles that come and attack healthy trees, and once the tree is dead, they leave, and then there's beetles that come in that um, attack dead trees. So right now there's those beetles, so they're not as high of a concern as to be moving. They won't move on to your healthy trees. Okay, so if we have an area that's all black. Then I, I, I would Any feel that it's okay. That's okay now because um, the, the, the xylem and the phloem are not flowing. The juices are gone. So you're really only disturbing beetles that attack dead trees. So I think that's a, a decent time. Uh, now, any time for those trees. But if you have adjacent live healthy trees, um, definitely think about it. I recommend you order as soon as you know you want to plant. So start planning to plant, you know, before July 1st or before 
or, you know, or the first Monday of July or the first Monday of December. That because since we are a statewide program, <laughs> we get everybody from everywhere ordering. So, um, and that's another thing when you're looking at the drop down menu that on our order line, online thing, there's trees that won't pertain at all to where you live. So read the descriptions of elevation and water use and, you know, all that. I mean, for here, you probably went Ponderosa, you know, Doug Fir, Rocky Mountain Juniper, you know, if you, if you need cottonwood, stuff like that, it will show in there. And we also have shrubs. When you plant, we always say water twice a week. <laughs> so if you're planting out here, you know, and you can't water twice a week, your success rate goes down considerably. You know, if you have if you water twice a week, you probably have a good 80% survival. If you, you know, if you protect them from the deer and all that good stuff, you know. But if you just outplant it, can go, you know, if you're lucky, you might have 50% survival, and it might be closer to 25. So, so if you have some way of watering your seedlings, even sporadically, you you know, your chances increase. We offer everything from Ponderosa, Blue Spruce, um, Bristlecone Pine, uh, Engelman Spruce, Douglas Fir, White Fir, Pignon, all the way down to really dry land shrubs like our four wing salt bush and winter fats. So um, usually we have about 60 different species. Yeah, like I said, not all 60 apply to here. Some of them are very much southern New Mexico species because people plant there too. <laughs> but, um, another thing is I think most of, most of the erosion has stopped by now, but if you're still getting runoff where it just buries everything, don't plant yet. Because it'll just bury your trees and it'll be wasted effort on your part and, and money. And that's, you know, we don't want that. So um, once you get, you know, your soils and everything to where they're stable enough to plant, then plant. Um, we recommend you mulch your seedlings. Um, and Josh will talk about microsite planting and all that. So. But like in this example, if they've already been shipped, which you know, we've got our, our rack sitting out here today, if you peeked at them, you can see that some of them are already breaking bud, they're going. Uh, you would basically want to, want to treat them like any other kind of horticultural or garden plant or starts that you have. Um, you know, try to, try to keep them from being exposed to extreme temperatures, um, keep them out of the wind, um, keep them sheltered, keep them watered. Um, if, depending how long you might expect them to have to hold them over, you might put them in kind of a, a pop-up shelter where they, they get, you know, partial sun parts of the day, or even if you have them out in full sun, you just want to make sure you keep them watered. And, and just like garden plants, you can kind of judge that by just poking a finger down in the media, you know, up to, you know, maybe your second knuckle to, to get a feel for what kind of moisture you have down in there. And if it feels dry, you know, they need water is pretty straightforward. Uh, but really, if you need to hold them over, it's really just about keeping them watered, keeping them out of extreme heat, sun, and wind. Contour felling is um, working working with the contour. Um, one of the reasons, like like currently, Forest Service doesn't encourage doing contour felling because it's one of those things that can be done incorrectly, and it does want to be done properly to work effectively. Um, so a contour is a level line across a slope. Um, like right now, I see most of you guys are, there's like a big old line of people right here. None of you are standing on the contour. 
it's you're all uh, um, over on this side everybody's five feet higher than everybody over on this side that is that is not the contour and so it's creating a level line across a slope there's a bunch of easy quick tools to do that um, over time it's something that you can get pretty close by eye um, they're using uh, transits if you want to get really accurate um, it, in your guides on the last page I'm not going to go over building them right now but there's a there's a quick thing uh, a quick a-frame to build um, that we have everything we need right here to do it um, and th there are a lot of other tools you can use a clinometer um, another thing that works awesome to find something level is go old school that's level right there um, you can tell so that's lined up with everybody on the slope it's not level um, the critical thing is getting them level because uh, you if, if you get them off level water water pools and it runs that's that what what happens when they're off level is it does channelize water and and increase erosion issues um, but if it's set level it can uh, reduce reduce water the whole goal with any of it is slowing water down and spreading it out across the slope um, so ceiling you'll you'll see in those handouts um, of how to place structures um, and it's it's a really good quick easy guide to look through um, this is also an area that in the fall before all of the the logging work was done we came through we did a workshop and and did all of this contour felling um, some other considerations when you're doing that like the reason one of the reasons why we set this contour felling the way we did is because the landowners knew that they were going to come in and cut all these trees so trying to set them in 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 a pattern doing doing lines down a slope so find a contour and working across a contour and then find one find another contour a little ways down and working another contour is important partially for access um, most of these structures stayed fairly intact um, this is immediate immediately after the logging was done and none of the structures have been have been messed with since we put them in in the fall um, so some of them are not quite right some of them are still really really well placed the biggest thing is getting getting them level and getting the, the them sealed you want to get the log in contact with the ground and get the log anchored really well um, you don't want to stack too high you want no one? no um, your goal is you are retaining some amount of sediment um, but the 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 way contour felling really works is by quantity um, you can't uh, unlike like a one rock dam you can go back and build on top of a one rock dam over and over and over to grade a channel mm -hmm. um, we're not necessarily trying to grade this slope meaning build this slope back up we're not necessarily trying to do that we're trying to create small small pockets that hold some material um, they hold some sediment they hold some they hold back some seed source um, they hold back some moisture and create perfect opportunities for vegetation to start growing and then the other thing we didn't get into a whole lot earlier is when you're planting your species mix um, for a planting operation definitely i i always recommend working with a forester on planning your reforestation operations and those i would recommend as some of your first points of contact that are going to be able to help point you in the right direction and help get you thinking about the different things that might need to happen
to eventually come together for that, re that full spectrum of restoration work on your property. And one of those is gonna be species. Part of that is thinking about what was there before, of course, but part of that is also gonna be thinking about in a time of climate change, like we find ourselves in, what might that site look like in the future? And this is something that, that James here was asking me about when we came and looked at this earlier is, you know, what's this gonna look like in the future? Is this site gonna be able to support ponderosa pine in the future? And, and in this case, I, I think, yes, absolutely. You know, we've, we've got plenty of ponderosa pine doing fine at, at this elevation, this area. This will probably be fine as a ponderosa pine site into the future. And I, and I mentioned he might start thinking about adding some pinyon, you know, at a low density maybe in on, on the low end, just so there's something there to, to start adding some diversity and resilience there. Uh, but everybody is going to be in a different situation. And so that's where it's going to be important for you to know your land, to look at it, to, to think about it, and to work with a, a forester that has maybe seen how things work out on other sites and on other reforestation operations that can provide some advice. So, so that's kind of the, one of the first things I wanted to mention is, is I definitely always recommend working with your, your district forester and their, their staff on planning. Um, plan ahead, order as far in advance as you can. Carol mentioned seed source earlier. Uh, you always want to make sure that, that wherever you get seedlings from, whatever species they are, that they have been grown from a seed source that's appropriate for your area and your property. Because um, we take ponderosa pine, for example, and this is something that, that we've seen happening some um, and that folks have asked me about. Ponderosa pine has a huge native range. You know, it, it grows from basically northern Mexico all the way up through Canada. And right now, as a lot of folks know, we have kind of a seedling shortage in New Mexico until we get the new nursery with the New Mexico Reforestation Center built up. And so we've had a number of folks calling us to ask, well, can I, can I go to a nursery out of Colorado? Can I go to a nursery out of California? They've got ponderosa pine seedlings. And my response is, is typically, what seed source is it? You know, what were they grown from? Because if that's a, a Montana or an Idaho or a Colorado or a Northern California seed source, even though it's ponderosa pine, it's not likely to do well here because that's gonna be a seed source that's adapted for a different, more Northern area. So that's something else that, that I just wanted to get people thinking about as, as you're figuring out where your seedlings might come from if that's not through the conservation seedling program. So I usually, I usually wouldn't recommend planting it because it, it does usually come back pretty aggressively and effectively on its own. And if we look around, even with this really recent operation, we've got, it's not everywhere yet, but we've got quite a bit popping up already. And you're right, that does help with slope stabilization. And, and it's great for that. It's really tenacious after a fire and it's one of our, our first naturally regenerating woody species, tree species, depending on what area you're in, what size it gets to, that'll help stabilize that slope and we can use it as a, as a shelter object during planting. Where I would say we want to be careful about gamble oak is on sites where it was really heavy before the fire. And one of the things we see is, is post-fire, if we have an area that already had a really heavy gamble oak population, and if we don't quickly come up with a plan to get in there and control that to reforest the site with something other than gamble oak, we can pretty quickly end up with a situation where we just have a, a whole mountain of gamble oak that would outcompete about any seedlings we try to plant into it and would then require a whole lot of additional expensive site preparation work to control that gamble oak enough to get anything else established. It, it, in situations like that, it can be very competitive. But on a, on a site like this, where it's, it's still at kind of a natural density, it's spread out, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say it's nice to have. Um, avoid is we're looking for a little bit of shelter in the kinds of areas that would hold a little bit of moisture, but we're trying to avoid extremes. So, 
we wouldn't want to be planting on top of a little exposed micro ridge that is just going to dry out and have that wind running right over top of it. So that's the kind of place to avoid when you're planting. And then the flip side of that, and I'm not seeing any spots right here that would be bad for this, uh, but you want to avoid areas that look like they're still going to be eroding out because if you see an area that's starting to develop rills, starting to develop you know, some kind of little head cut or gully erosion, you wouldn't want to be planting under that where your seedlings could wash out. You know, talking about site prep, a lot of this, a lot of what, what was done here is also really good site preparation for planting. So all of these chips are gonna help so hold soil moisture. They're gonna help hold soil. The contour felling has given us those shelter objects as well as helping prevent big erosion. What we want is a planting tool that is going to make a planting hole of a depth and width appropriate for the planting stock. And what we're trying to do is make a small planting slit, planting hole, that is the right size for the seedling to fit down in entirely while disturbing the soil as little as possible. Uh, so whenever we're doing this, you'll see that operationally we'll typically use a planting bar. And for anyone that wants to, to try these later, we got a truckload of them. Uh, they are not light. They get heavier the longer you're using them. <laughs> but you see that it's about the right width. And when you drive that in pretty close to the foot pegs, it's about the right depth for the type of seedlings that we're planting. These also hold up a lot better than shovels. You start, you start trying to shovel plant on a lot of these hard rocky sites uh, and, and the way, yeah, you know, the way we have to open these planting holes after we get the bar in, you know, there, there are times that we break these bars and you can imagine how many shovel handles you, you'd go through. So a number of reasons to recommend planting bars for operational planting. But if you're using whatever tools you have on hand, just keep that in mind that your objective, what you're trying to do, is to just make a slit in the ground. And you'll see this on the handout. There's a little diagram for it. We're just trying to put the tool in the ground, open up a little planting hole deep enough to drop that seedling all the way in up to the root collar so you don't have any roots showing. So the base of that stem should be at or just below ground level. And then we'll put that planting tool in right next to the hole and lever that hole closed. So we're just you know, opening that ground up and then punching in beside it to just lever it closed again and then kind of tamp around it, make sure the planting hole's fully closed, make sure the roots are all the way down in the ground. Don't see any exposed roots. Around here, planting a little bit deep is gonna be better than planting a little bit shallow. Um, you plant a little bit shallow, you've got exposed roots, that's gonna be really stressful on the seedling. And for those of you that, that are gonna be hiring contractors to do the work, definitely recommend either yourself or, or through somebody else going out and doing planting inspections after the tree planting operation is done. Just to make sure those trees were planted properly, that they're in the ground, all the roots are in the ground, that the holes are closed properly. Uh, and so then that's, that's kind of the gist of it. And then the last thing we'll do basically is just take a couple of fingers after you plant it and just give it a little tuck to see if it feels like it, it's gonna just slip right back out of the ground. And if it feels like it's, and you don't have to pull too hard, you're just making sure it's snug down in that planting hole because you're trying to get that good root to soil contact between those seedling roots and the soil root because it's those roots growing out into that native soil on your site that are gonna let that seedling establish and survive. So that root to soil contact is important. That's also why we don't recommend digging out a hole. That's why we use a planting bar like this to just make a narrow little slit without disturbing the soil much and then to just close it on the seedling. If we start digging out a hole, we're disrupting all of that soil structure. And when we try to put it back, no matter you know how much we try to pack it in there, 
we're still going to be leaving a lot of new air pockets in that soil and it's going to settle and we're still going to have new air pockets and those air pockets are going to dry out your seedlings root system and lead to increased mortality planting bags we'll usually use a rubberized planting bag to carry that stock around on the field uh, you can throw your lunch and a water bottle in in one of those uh, but You've noticed that we've put up pop-up shelters to, to keep the seedlings shaded while we've been sitting around here. Uh, we always want to do everything we can to keep those seedlings from drying out. And that goes for when we're out in the field too. So we'll usually use, you know, if we're doing operations, we'll be carrying seedlings around in one of these rubberized bags to help keep them out of the wind, help them keep them out of the sun, keep them from getting dried out while we're hiking up and down the hills. Uh, but then if you don't have that, you know, you can think of whatever you have. You know, it can be a tote bag, it can be a five gallon bucket, you know, just something that, that'll be just a little portable shelter for that. You know seat. how much those two items cost? So once I get that cleared a little bit, and this is looking really rocky, so you're probably gonna get to watch me put my bar into a rock and then go pick a different site. <laughs> Yeah. So in this case, I can feel rocks all around that. And when you're when you're testing a spot, one of your best indicators of whether that's a spot you should put a seedling or not, the planting bar is going to tell you. Basically, you know, if if that's not soil all the way down. If there are so many rocks on the sides that you think about how you're going to have to close that hole from the side, and if that's a whole bunch of rocks that are also going to be leaving air pockets in there, don't feel bad about giving up on a hole. It is a lesson. All right. I think I can work with this one. <laughs> All right, so we we still got rocks, and, and I mean that's just where we are. Yeah. You know, it's it's really just about finding that that balance between what's doable and and what you shouldn't bother with because your tree would die. But so we got enough here. We'll see what I hit down here. But, All right, so we're good. So we want to get that planting bar in down as vertical as possible. We want to make sure we can get that depth to get that whole root system in. Uh, so in my case, different people teach you to use a planting bar slightly differently. In my case, I'll drive it in with the flat side away from me and then pull back toward me to open that hole. So back to about a 45 enough to drop that tree in the hole. I'm going to pull that back and then forward to vertical again that'll help stabilize that front face of the hole. And then I pull that planting bar out. Now I've got a little planting hole, just that little open slit. So depending on where you're getting your seedlings from, they might come in the nursery container like this or they might come pulled out of these and kind of bundled up in bags, um, might be in a box. Different nurseries do different things depending on where you're getting them. But wherever you're getting them, if they're in these, just kind of work around that to loosen them up a little. And then from the base of the tree, so you don't want to pull them out where it'd strip root. So if it's not coming out easily, you want to keep working that around until the roots aren't holding on to the bottom. That's one of the problems with holding them over, like we mentioned earlier. So you want to get that out, keep the plug intact. Don't leave your containers on site. So throw them back in the bag. If you've got a two bin bag, sometimes you might use one for empties, one for trees. And so then, want this snug down in that planting hole. So that sits down basically 
the way that's sitting down there, the soil surface is coming to about here when, when I close that hole, just to give you a visual since you're back there. So I'll drop that in. And then I'm gonna come about a hand's width back toward me from where I opened that hole. And again, for me, I'll keep that flat face of the bar forward because I'm gonna wanna use it to lever that hole closed on the roots. And I usually come in at a slight angle, kind of toward the bottom of the planting hole. And so then what that allows me to do is close that entire planting hole from bottom to top in one go. And the second hole is usually easier than the first one. So once you get that in there, I'm gonna lever that forward. So we're getting that good native soil to root system contact, closing that planting hole. And then I'm gonna come back a couple inches from that second hole. I'm gonna do the same thing to close that second hole I just made. And then that second, that final hole, I'm just gonna kinda kick at and get a bunch of junk in there. Just to, just to not leave a divot. Then I'm gonna pull these needles up just gently to get them up off the ground. So I'm gonna use my boots to just gently help close that hole. Just a little bit more. So then when I'm done, I should be able to look at that, not see any roots. The ground level is at the base of the stem, no roots poking out. Holes closed so I don't see any slit with the air pockets down around the roots. Give it a little tug. Definitely in there good and snug, not falling out, not washing out. If you want, you can kind of re-mulch it then. And we got a tree in the ground. That's pretty. Do you recommend putting water? Uh, if, if it's in a place where you could water it, there, there absolutely would not be any, any harm in giving it some water. Typically when I plant, you just put water before you close the hole. I, I bet they love you for it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. yeah. That's so cute. I know. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. All right. Well, so that's, I mean, that's the basics of the process. The information that I received here, I, like I was just telling Carol, will stop me from doing some of the things that I was going to do that would have probably been more detrimental than if I had just left everything alone. Right on. Right Thank on. you. Come back in about 15 years, hopefully he'll be big. <laughs>